Frank O'Connor was one of the most gifted and lucid storytellers of our lifetime. His writing was taught and disciplined, and in it he restrained his natural cork facility for words in order to achieve a tight structure. He was possibly even more entertaining when he spoke, because he relaxed his writer's rules and, as it were, let down his literary hair. And he had a beautiful voice. About 30 years ago, he reminisced about his Civil War experiences, and he recalled his adventures as a 17-year-old in minute and humorous detail. What gave the Civil War its peculiar note of macabre comedy was that nobody on either side really wanted to fight. On my very first day at the front, I, of course, was taken prisoner. My divisional commandant, Liam D.C., sent me across country with dispatches. It was very quiet everywhere, and as I motored through Charleville, I obeyed uh, General D.C.'s orders, and I checked with the officer in charge of the town the, that there wasn't an enemy soldier within miles. But what he failed to remember was that it was Sunday. And on Sunday, the whole Irish race is unanimously moved to go to Mass. So that at that very moment, our whole front line, pickets, machine gun posts and all, had simply melted away. Well, you might think on the other hand that the enemy's line had done the same. But a considerable number of the Free State troops who were facing us were natives of Charleville. And after his longing for mass, an Irishman's strongest characteristic is his longing for home and mother. So that in fact, our whole front that morning was being pierced by nostalgic enemy soldiers, all pining to embrace their mothers and find out if the cow had calved. I was thinking how peaceful it all was, the flat green country and the people coming home from mass between the sun-shot hedges, when suddenly men in semi-uniform emerged from the hedges and leveled their rifles at the car. I wasn't in the least worried. I knew they must be our own men, but my driver hissed, ate him, obviously referring to my dispatches. Now, all I can say is that my driver must have seen dispatches eaten on the movies because even a horse couldn't have swallowed DC's dispatches in the few minutes that remained to me. So I just tore them up and tossed them to the wind. Then we reached a roadblock. And as I'd left my gun behind me, my brilliant career as a soldier was over on my very first day at the front. To say I was humiliated wouldn't even begin to describe it. I was taken to enemy headquarters in a farmhouse and before long, we were besieged by my own side, who had just returned from mass. They blasted us with rifle and machine gun fire, and in the first few minutes, a young soldier was killed upstairs. The firing went on until evening, and with the windows barricaded, we were almost in darkness. A disagreeable officer in the room with me was firing his revolver out the window, and singing in a voice of agonizing cheerlessness. You called me baby doll a year ago. You told me I was very nice to know. Just then there was a terrific explosion and shouts of rifle grenade and Mossy is killed. Mossy was the nice officer. And at last they began to shout, we surrender, we surrender and I was pushed out of the door waving a white handkerchief. So we were all taken prisoner this time by the right side though. I've noticed that soldiers at times like this are very temperamental, not to say nervous, and I had a terrible time persuading both sides of the general good faith. The body of the young soldier who had been killed was dragged downstairs He'd been shot through the cheek. Mossy, the officer I had admired, was lying out in the yard. He'd been shot in the mouth. And everything was bathed in a rich, moss 
green, watery light. While from over the Limerick grasslands came the distracted lowing of cows who'd gone on milk and who were quite sure that the end of the world was coming. Frank O'Connor. <laughs>